As we know, Apollo 15 was the first to include a rover. This allegedly enabled the astronauts to cover a much broader area than they could have done on foot. Missions 16 and 17 also included rovers. But 15 is the only one for which we have full area coverage and good lighting conditions. So let's look at that, shall we? Here's a map of the entire area showing where the rover is said to have gone, including the station markers where they stopped and the crater names. For now we'll be focusing on the right hand portion since it corresponds to the 50km image of this region. This part of the top is the landing area. It's what people looking at the LRO presentations would normally be interested in. We'll be looking at that and the area surrounding it. First note that there are rover tracks extending downwards to the south. We'll be comparing these tracks from the LRO pics. Here is the LRO image of that same area. This is taken from the 50km raw TIFF image and adds some contrast and adjustments to strongly accentuate the tracks. Below the lander base, we see some tire tracks extending downwards. Although compared with the tracks to the top and the left of the lander, they appear somewhat fainter. Let's see where they lead, shall we? As we follow them down, notice how they steadily become fainter. Then around about here, they disappear altogether. Well, that's odd. That's nothing like the tracks near the lander, which are quite dark. Realistically, we should expect the same degree of darkness further down. In fact, we should expect this part to be darker, because that's where the tracks here consist of two overlapping tracks. It represents the path here in which they drove in both directions. So by all accounts, the part down here should be darker than the various one-way drives around the limb. But instead, they're missing altogether. Let's go further afield, down here at the Spur Crater at Station 7, where they've said to have found the Genesis Rock. Genesis does. What Nintendo? There's a fair amount of activity here in terms of rover tracks and boot prints, so you'd expect that to appear on the LRO images, right? We'll have a look. Well, apparently not. Let's work our way up towards June Crater at Station 4. Okay, there's certainly no tracks along here either. And no activity at June either, apparently. The same problem occurs elsewhere. The boot print and track marks that feature very prominently in the landing area are either incredibly faint or impossible to see elsewhere. The only place I could find tracks far from the limb was way down at the southern corner between Station 6 and 6A. Here, we can just make out a pair of tracks winding around towards the west before fading completely. It's almost like someone started drawing these tracks on it and then gave up when they found they had too much work. Can't say I blame them. This area is huge. Still, the lack of tracks hasn't stopped NASA from drawing attention to these various stations. On this news release, we find this thumbnail of the Spur Crater and Station 7 and 6A. It links to this enlargement. Can you believe it? They have arrows pointing at... NOTHING! Now with the latest 20km images, we'd presumably have a similar problem. And at the new resolution, it would be more prominent. Or it would be, if we were able to see the whole thing. As mentioned earlier, we only get to see a small region immediately surrounding the landing area. To put that into perspective, here's how the latest Apollo 17 image compares with the full Traverse region. Yep, pretty small. Most of the rover tracks would be well outside it, and hence there would be no need to draw them in if they weren't there. Could this be the reason why the full-sized images are not supplied? 
Looking at the top left corner of each annotated image, there's a reference number, starting with an M, followed by a string of numbers, and then a couple more letters. If you're familiar with the earlier LRO images, you will know that this is always referred to the wide area raw image, such as this Apollo 15 one that we looked at earlier. But try the same for the new 25km images, and you'll come back empty handed. The only equivalent Zoomify RAW image available is this for Apollo 17, except it's annotated and no larger than the one published on the announcement page. Does this mean there's no larger image after all? Well, turns out there is. To accompany their LRO teleconference briefing, ASU also supplied this short video covering the Apollo 17 site. Let's have a look, shall we? At the very opening, the first thing we see is an overhead view of the Apollo 17 site, except it covers a much wider area than what we're given in the downloads. Ah, so there is a larger image! Now, why aren't we given access to this elsewhere? It then zooms in for a closer look, highlights a few features, then pans to the left. We'll stop it here. Notice how we are now on the left of the supplied image. This line here represents the edge of the supplied image. And look, the rover tracks have disappeared on the other side of it. It then pans to the right. We'll stop here. Now we are to the right of the supplied image. This vertical line represents the rightmost edge. And as before, the rover tracks have suddenly disappeared beyond it. Amazing! Referring to our traverse map, we should definitely see tracks here spread out to the right. And some more tracks heading downwards. But according to the video, there's nothing to be found down here either. We can actually get a better view by looking at the opening frame of the video because it shows the widest area. By comparing this to the same area in the traverse maps, there should be two tracks leading off to the left and running off beneath Camelot Crater there. But looking at the LRO images, again, there are no rover tracks to be seen outside the narrow confines of the landing area. For a long time, I had always suspected that NASA had duped the guys at ASU. After all, the images were first received by NASA's White Sands Tracking Facility. The files are then transferred to NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, who in turn pass them to ASU. I had always suspected that this elaborate game of pass the parcel with the images gave NASA the opportunity to photo manipulate the images before finally handing them over to Arizona State University. But now, after discovering this broad area Apollo 17 image, with its clear lack of rover tracks withheld from distribution, I can't help but wonder if the team at Arizona State University are also part of the conspiracy. This video was put together by ASU, which means they must have access to the files that composed it. Presumably, they have the broad area images of the other sites as well. It makes you wonder what else they're withholding. Let me emphasize there's a big difference between resolving an object and detecting it. And for most of these pieces of equipment, we're detecting it, and we know that it's hardware because I can correlate them with service pictures that we've got, you know, that the astronauts do. Um, otherwise, some of these are so small that you wouldn't really know if it was a rock or a piece of hardware. But as we keep increasing the resolution, you move from the detection realm into the resolving realm. And I think like the descent stages, we're now beginning to resolve the descent stages because we can actually start to identify pieces and tell that this is a man-made piece of hardware and not just a big rock surface. This is the third resolution, so to speak, that we've released. In the commissioning phase, when we flew over the Apollo landing sites, our altitude was about 100 kilometers. So those very first images we released 
just about two years ago um, were one meter per pixel. Then over the last two years, we've released at least one, but in some cases two, new views of all the Apollo landing sites at the 50 centimeters. So I don't know if you've seen those or not. And then now we've got 25 centimeters. So there's actually three different resolutions that we've released over time. So you know, just be careful to go and compare the one meter. It's kind of fun to do. I was doing that over the weekend, comparing the one one meter images, the 50 centimeter images, and now the 25 centimeter images. Think about it. All that hype about how clear and visually superior the 20 kilometer images supposedly are, when just eight months prior they were released and even blogged about a 50 kilometer image of the same location that shows the exact same resolution and detail. So once again, these pictures from LRO are all hype and have only given us more evidence of a hoax than evidence of the landings being real. In fact, if NASA has their way, there may never again be any more landing site photos, period. The day after these photos were released, I was pointed in the direction of a September 7th article in the Hindu, announcing that come October, the Apollo landing sites will be declared no-fly zones so as to protect the historical relics of rocket exhaust and dust on future missions. Having never heard of this paper, I first thought it was a joke. However, a quick Google search reveals a large number of reputable news services covering the same story. They all refer to an announcement made in the September 2nd, 2011 issue of Science Magazine. How ironic! Although either owned by NASA or one of its space collaborators, none of the previous lunar spacecrafts have photographed anything that was not already resolved by pre-Apollo missions, and the only so-called evidence for manned missions later turned out to be erroneous like the mysterious halo photographed by Cellini, Clementine and Chandrian 1, which later turned out to be a bunch of impact craters. Now, after the LRO has only added fuel to the moon hoax fire, NASA suddenly declares that the Apollo sites will be no-fly zones and therefore no one will be able to photograph the sites. All you NASA guys ever do is wave your finger about how you're going to prove that Apollo was real and yet you're constantly proving the exact opposite! What's wrong with you people?!